All right, so hello again. Um, I am Lindsay Granger Weaver, one of the associate directors on the advising and programs team at Beyond Barnard, and welcome to our first grad school series event on uh, featuring alums who have degrees in social work. And so we get started. We have some questions that I'm going to ask. Feel free to um, follow up in the chat if you have follow up questions. We'll also have some time at the end for y'all to come off of mute and you know say what you need to say. So for our panelists, um, just please introduce yourselves by briefly describing your academic and professional path from Barnard to the present. And I will start with Vicki because they are closest to me. Sure, hi, um, I'm Vicki Campos. Um, in terms of my path, well, I was an economics major and an environmental science minor. So a lot of people are like, how'd you end up in social work? Um, and then what happened was I really love volunteering in nonprofits and that's kind of how I ended up in it. Um, I kept volunteering in it and then eventually I was like, oh, I should just get a job in nonprofit because this is kind of my experience. Um, and the summer before my senior year, I volunteered with Let's Get Ready and I was a college advisor and I loved it. I was helping people with their college essays and I was really good at it and I set up college tours. And then I kept volunteering in that for I'd say the next four or five years. And I actually came back to Barnard to the college, to the career center. And I was like, is this a career? Could I get paid to do this? And Christine um, was like, actually, I just got an email um, that is a job exactly like you're talking about. And that was my first job in as a college advisor. And I've been college advising since, and that was five years ago. Um, I started, I decided to get my MSW I guess maybe three or four years ago, because um, I honestly, as an economics major, you think, let me get an MBA. And then I would sit in MBA classes and I love them, but I was like, this isn't really what I want to do. Um, and so then I kind of went through all the options, MBA, MPA, MPH, like all of them. And then masters in counseling, all these things. And then eventually, I started noticing that a lot of the people I was working with had MSWs and I was like, oh, I should get an MSW. That kind of makes sense. Um, and I went to Hunter and I loved it. And I think it was the best thing I could have done. Great. Um, so Angela, you wanna introduce yourself? <laughs> Sure. Um, my name is Angela Luna. I'm a clinical social worker um, here in Austin, Texas. Uh, I was a women's studies major at Barnard and loved it, loved reading and writing and talking and all the things um, that you do in that world. And um, a few things happened in my life uh, around, you know, junior, senior year when you're trying to figure out what's next that kind of put the um, MSW program on my radar. Um, and that was after I had gone into uh, my undergraduate work thinking I wanted to be a doctor. So my, um, uh, my aunt that I really loved very much died um, the summer before I came to Barnard. I was 18 and she had cancer and um, a long illness. And I got to see a bunch of different types of professionals working with her and around her and my family. and. Um, that experience really stuck in my mind. So I thought I wanted to be a doctor, realized I was no good at chemistry and biology and suffered through some of those classes early on at Barnard and kind of had to reassess, like, what am I good at? What do I want to do? I knew I wanted to work in um, the healthcare world. I knew I wanted to work with people. And like I said, some things kind of just fell into place where that idea of um, becoming a, a professional social worker really seemed intriguing. So I went to NYU um, for my master's. Um, I decided to go there as opposed to some of the other programs because it had more of a clinical focus. Um, though now, you know, I do wonder if I missed out on the bigger advocacy piece and we can talk about that for sure. But, um, and it was all right. It was nothing as wonderful as my Barnard experience, but I worked in the city for um, seven years at NYU Langone Medical Center on 34th and 1st as a, as a social worker. I got my clinical license in that time that I worked in the hospital. Um, 
it was uh, a grueling and exciting experience and kind of got my social work chops and then moved to Texas and had a couple different jobs here uh, until I landed at my current job, which is, you know, I'll go out on a limb and say really my dream job. It's in an academic medical center here in Texas within a medical school, actually working with students and in an oncology clinic. So after that long and winding road, I'm working in the part of the field that I really have wanted to be in all along. So we'll definitely talk about that more as we go along, if you're interested, because I can tell you about that. Thanks, Angela. And now we've got Kenya. Please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. So um, thank you all for having me. Um, my name is Kenya George. I am class of 2010. Um, wow, I don't think I've ever said that out loud. And like, so yeah, I'm class of 2010. Like, I mean, like in my like professional life. So it's been a while since um, I've been amongst a, lot, a bunch of Barnard women, which is like a little tingly inside. So it's such a pleasure. Um, I got my undergrad at Barnard um, psych major. Um, I've always been a part of like youth development, um, social services. So even in high school, I worked at the agency that I was with for about on and off for about like 13 years. Um, so as a administrator, my role, um, I started off at Barnard, I was working part-time at an after-school program and I realized that my life purpose was aligned with like transforming communities. And so um, throughout Barnard, I used to do summer camps. Um, and once I uh, got my degree, I started off as an after-school program um, coordinator. Um, and I was there for a few years um, and decided, I took a year off and then I decided it was time to go back to school. So I have my a master's in social work from Hunter, um, of community organizing, planning and development. So I did not do the clinical route, even though I am very much so cl clinically like oriented. Um, and I think for me, what I loved about um, that particular type of training was that you, you got a really good sense of like how macro, micro and meso all work together for the environment of like communities. I think also um, in my role as director of um, programming at my current job, um, it allows me to really understand how systems work and more importantly, but also then how to like coach and support people, right? Cause it's like, how do you move the agenda of like the organization while still being, especially now like that we're in COVID, um, how do you then um, inspire, meet people where they are, right? Which is like a, very foundational like social work term like you meet people where they are and like and that really does have transformational like meaning when you're like working from that particular lens and so why social work I think for me um outside of just wanting to like support and transform communities I had to think through I did not know what I wanted to do and I, I'm still not sure right which is interesting in my career to like still not really know um but what drew me to the MSW was like what what degree in like social services helping professions could open up the most doors for me um right so if I wanted to do therapy right if I wanted to um be a CEO of a, a nonprofit, like there's so many different um like you can find a social worker any any and everywhere right um there's certain degrees that you will not and I think that's why I decided to transition into that MSW and I don't regret it at all. I do think that um, when people see an MSW like behind my name, there's a certain assumption around like my particular lens and my, my practice that makes me a lot more um, marketable when I'm applying to jobs or talking about my particular career. So I'll stop there and let uh, more questions flow. Yeah, thanks for that. And that kind of leads into this next little bit um all of you touched on kind of like a little bit about why you went into msw can you talk a little more about maybe that decision as opposed to some other they're helping professions or even the particular tracks within social work um as someone who has a counseling degree so the other the other side of the road <laughs> um <laughs> i know that much but like can you just say more about maybe the pros and cons similarities and differences about the different tracks and also just also just the helping professions kind of broadly yeah 
Um, as someone who kind of explored so many degree options before finally settling on MSW, I kind of felt like every single degree could help someone. Like I could get an MBA and figure out a way to help people. I could get an MPA, MPH, like all these things and help people. Um, but honestly, what drew me to social work was the social justice element of it all. Um, I became really active in the social justice scene, I'm going to say in 2014, 2015, and haven't stopped since. And honestly, all of that is probably what led me to social work. Um, I did do the clinical track because I wanted to learn about mental health and things like that. But I also feel like I've learned how these systems have like affected, especially people of color and all these things and like how to work towards kind of like decolonizing social work itself and clinical work itself too. So it was really great um, to go to Hunter. And I also picked it because what if one day I didn't want to be a therapist anymore? And so I have the flexibility to become anything I really want. Because like Kenya said, I have literally seen social workers everywhere. Like I was just on LinkedIn the other day and someone I know who is a social worker at a nonprofit I used to work at is now at Morgan Stanley. And so you can be a social worker literally in any type of job. And so I got drawn to it because of the flexibility of the degree. Um, like I could get this MSW and yeah, be a therapist or yeah, continue my college advising work, or I could end up somewhere really fancy like JP Morgan Chase. Um, and so it, it, it allows such a versatile and that's what really drew me to it aside from the social uh, justice aspect of it. I think too, to add to what you were saying, Vicky, I think that on a very concrete nuts and bolts, like practical level, it depends on the state that you plan to live in or practice in. And that's really hard to know, I know, but um, you know, social workers are pretty universally, as far as I've seen, I've lived in only two states, but um, since my degree, but um, are pretty universally hired into big systems like hospitals and school systems, whereas some of the other degrees that might be seen as similar, like an LPC or that sort of thing, it depends on the state or an LMFT, that's the other big one for clinical work, a licensed marriage and family therapist. So in California, LMFTs are a dime a dozen, but um, in a state like Texas, where I am, you have to have a social work degree in order to work in lots of the places that I have um, practiced. And it's also worth noting that states like New York and California pay social workers more than a lot of, um, you know, in my anecdotal observation, just from people that I know, you know, they pay them, uh, they're better paid for whatever reason than maybe some of those other um, people that have to be out on their own in a private practice and really hustle to really make what they need to make to live. So um, that's on a very practical level, I think another consideration. So I think for, um, for me, when you think about like the skills, I think what social workers are trained to do, um, and not to say like, if you got like your, um, your degree in counseling or in psychology that you're not missing, like you're not missing anything. But I think that um, one with social work, like you were really like ex examining power Right, like no matter where, like um, whether it be in the clinical piece, community organizing piece, like there's always a conversation around power and privilege, right? And so, like that's a really important lens. Um, so when you think about, um, especially when you're helping um, folks from disenfranchised communities, right? So like, and that's kind of like where I'm aligned in, in terms of purpose work. So when you um, are examining power and privilege, um, that's just like a skill. Um, and knowing how to like influence power and privilege, um, it's uh, it's an art, right? And so like being able to have an opportunity to really think about power and like talk about power in ways that are extremely uncomfortable just really gives you a leg up like in the world, especially as a woman, right? Um, and um, so I think that that's really important to mention. I also think that when we, you can literally, like Vicky said, like you can find social workers any and everywhere. Um, and it's a very adaptable, like it's a, like the skills that we learn um, is able to be transferable to different industries in a way that sometimes if you have um, a psych degree, right, it's very, very theory based. 
Um, and a lot of, depending on where you wanna work, like some folks are, they care about theory and they want you to make sure that they, you know it, but there are some folks are like, can you put it into practice, right? Like when you're talking to this parent or when you're talking to this um, person in crisis, are you able to kind of bring the theory into practice and like understand this person as a full person that's had a full life, right? Um, that I, yeah, just to add, and I agree with everyone, everything else that my um, peer said. Yeah, so it sounds like the key, oh, sorry. I was just gonna add, Kenya, I think we're the only people, I love that you said bringing that sort of examination of power and privilege into the clinical space too, because that is, I mean, I work one-on-one -on -one with, um, one-on-one -on -one with people and maybe small groups, you know, families, that sort of thing, but I don't know of another helping profession in mental health, at least that brings that into a clinical space to say like, hey, maybe you're depressed or maybe you have all of these systems, you know, sitting on top of you right now that are influencing, you know, what your daily life looks like. And maybe that does eventually lead us to a, a diagnosis of something, or maybe it leads us to a conversation to help understand, you know, what's happening in your life and how that is is impacting you. So I do think we're the only ones trained to do that among all the people that do similar work in these spaces. So that's why I, and I also love what you said about a set of assumptions about, you know, people make about you. And I think knowing that you have that MSW, I mean, when people ask me, who should I see for a therapist? I always say, I mean, you know, I'm biased, but <laughs> I, I think of course an MSW, like there's no reason why you would see someone else. Um, there are, mm -hmm. but you know, that's, that's for sure my bias. And I think people get that when they're looking, when they understand what our training is, they understand that they're coming to a place that understands more about them. And I think when you bring the, if I don't know who's interested in like more of the admin leadership, um, like community-based perspective, but what's interesting when you work with other colleagues who don't have an MSW and working in community, right? The conversations are just different, right? Not, um, it's like the entry point is different. Um, and I think that how is it different? I think a part of it is just like keeping people at the center of the work, right? Like, and also like, it's about the person and really thinking through what, what resources do you need to align them with in order for, the, for them to be strengthened, right? It's whether it be community, people, family, whatever the, the, the group of folks that you're working with. And I think that that's what, um, and that skill set is the thing that allows for social workers um, to be like the gatekeepers. Like they usually call social workers the gatekeepers because we are the ones that are directly interacting with the people, right? Um, in connection with the systems that we are then trying to manage, organize around, support, to align and connect and empower. Well, empower is a very interesting word or like um, support folks in tapping into their own power. Yeah, so I mean, and that was really helpful in terms of like kind of de teasing out some of the differences and, you know, also having been on the other side, I can definitely say all of that. <laughs> I echo everything about, you know, the, the focus of the different types of programs. Um, can you say a little bit about, you know, when you're in the program, we talk about getting the courses and getting the training, like what does that hands-on training look like um, for, for this degree? Yeah, so the reason I picked my specific program is so I could work full time. So Hunter offers various options. There's um, the full time program, which is like you take classes in the daytime, you do internships twice a week in your first year, and, um, and it kind of takes up your whole life. Some people manage to find some way to squeeze some jobs in there, some part time jobs, things like that. But the full-time program is pretty intense. You do get summers off, so I guess that's the difference. And so then I did what's called the one-year residency program, which is honestly a misnomer because people tend to think the program is one year, but it's not. Um, it's actually a set of six semesters. So you end up taking like less classes per semester the first three, and then um, you end up with a full load for the next two, and then just two for your last summer. And it allows you the flexibility to work in the daytime and then attend class at night. Um, right now, everything is currently remote. Um, but when you are in the one-year residency program, the first, um, the first 
year, you're working full time, taking classes and the summer, and then um, starting the fall of your second year, that's when two days out of your work week, you are doing an internship at your job. Um, so for example, like I was at the door, the door has various departments. So I was in the college department three days a week, and then two days a week, I was in the counseling department providing therapy. Um, and that was a lot, but I got through it and I really liked it and enjoyed it. Um, but I will say like OIR is pretty intense. Um, working full-time, going to school full-time can be a lot. I did it because um, I was in a union and the union provided like tuition um, assistance and that was extremely helpful. I got my degree at probably half the price of all my peers. Um, and probably even less because I also got a scholarship. And so a lot of, I got my degree for probably like $5,000 in comparison to the 30,000 that everyone else pays. Um, and so the tuition assistance and the scholarship, um, but honestly, like it's very intense. I was very exhausted the second year. You can ask my friends whenever we'd hang out, I'd fall asleep a lot, um, but I do think like my brain was having a great time, like learning and absorbing all these things. Um, and yeah, so like when you're doing clinical, the classes, you do learn theory. And then my favorite class is about power, privilege and oppression. And then that's really learning how to like see all this theory through that lens because we are in New York, we are going to be working with people with dealing with these things and so we should be able to like approach clinical work through this lens um and so that's it there's also now what's called like a specialization so like mine was mental health sometimes some people have immigrants some people have um sexuality so all sorts of things that you can like kind of specialize even more in um and i wrote about mental health and how racism affects people's mental health um, and so that was kind of what I ended up specializing in by the time I graduated. But I will say, like, it is tough to do a full time job and work full time for sure. Yeah, so from the community organized. So when I went to Hunter, I don't even know how I did it. Um, so I was in school full time. I worked part time and I had an internship um, three days a week. So the three days a week internship is a thing. And so it's like, you have to know that if you're going to do social work school or really like any like helping professions, there's probably going to be an internship tied to it. Um, the nonprofit sector really loves that, <laughs> just FYI. Um, so one of the things um, that I, my favorite course um, at Hunter was being able to like examine different social, social, social and political movements, right? Um, so a part of um, being and being trained in like community organizing, planning and development is to really understand like how to organize, right? And so being able to explore that was super cool. And then you have like your traditional courses like human behavior. Um, we all, uh, and Vicky help me to, cause it's been a while. The, the course that we always had to take, it's like around power and privilege. It was like a seminar mm -hmm. of some sort. We like to call it practice lab. Cause it's yes, kind of like practice where you practice lab. your so, That was very interesting. So the practice lab allowed for you to truly like talk through and, and delve into like the, the difficulties of practice, right? And so like, again, um, that is what separates, I think, um, theory and like really like thinking about, okay, you learned um, this concept, how does it actually work? Like, what are some things that you're experiencing in practice? Like what power issues that you like uh, encountered? Um, I think also what's important just in terms of like, what's like the course uh, load and things that you should probably know, um, in the community organizing track too, like you would get a sense of like policy, like how does like local state federal policy works, right? What are the, um, the, the places of influence that you can kind of push, right? Um, in community-based versus state-based versus um, more federally based. Um, I think for what's also like, what was also really helpful as an administrator, so like this planning and development piece 
was super huge, right? Because like understanding like the administration, like how like how to organize yourself, how to manage people, how to manage teams, it's not easy, right? And so when you have an opportunity to really like learn theory and like start to like think about practice, it's also, you're gonna hear me say theory and practice all the time, like for the next like 45 minutes, whatever amount of time we have. Um, that's also really important just to get a sense of like how like how to organize yourself how to um coach people train people like all of that was also really important in my in my track and my experience was a, a bit different because i didn't have that macro level well vicky had the clinical focus but in a different program um, than nyu is pretty clinically oriented. Um, and I mentioned before that I will be on, I feel like this is a place I can be honest that my schoolwork was not my coursework in the MSW program was not at all close to as stimulating as my Barnard time, you know, as a women's studies major and like with these all these brilliant women in the room. And um, I'll tell you just a little story that in my first day at NYU, I remember somebody a, a sweet woman raised her hand and asked the professor if we could get a summary of the readings from the syllabus. And I remember thinking like, wow, very different than Barnard, you know, where everyone would come to class and they'd already read the syllabus and they'd already read all the books, you know, they didn't need a summary from the professor. So it was just, I think I tell that story not to poke fun at that person, but really to just illustrate that for me, it was about learning in my placements and in my internships um, versus as much of the coursework because you know um we're all really capable intelligent women that you know could kind of for for me it was just a different type of learning happening so it wasn't in the classroom for me there wasn't a lot of um place in our classes for much of that discussion that i was used to in my undergraduate work i did also have a practice class like kind of um, the other women mentioned on the panel. So we did have that. And that was my favorite too, because it was the place where you could say, okay, this is what I'm learning. And this is what I'm seeing in my field placement. So I had two um, clinically focused healthcare um, internships. One was at an adult day health center. So a place where um, older adults with health and mental health challenges would come to, um, you know, be cared for during the day while their families were working or that sort of thing. Um, and then my second was at at NYU's uh, outpatient cancer center. So it was right in line with what I had hoped to be doing later um, in their breast clinic. So I worked with women um, and got to know them through the trajectory of their cancer care. So working one-on-one -on -one, clinically focused and you get, you know, you have a field supervisor, someone that um, really is there to walk you through your daily, um, you know, kind of encounters and what's happening in your work and what are you seeing and really to sort of mentor you there. Somebody who I still um, am very close to and have have a call with um, later this week to talk about actually some work that I'm doing in my current job and, and trying to connect back with what I had learned 10 plus 12 years ago. So um, that was how mine was a bit different. But I think we all kind of stressed that a lot of the learning happens in the field, like as you're on the job kind of in your internship or later on in your professional track. So uh, in some ways, it's about getting your work done just so you can get there, getting your, your classwork done so you can get your degree and go learn all the stuff. So Yeah, that's really good perspective um, on these where it's less about you know, like, yeah, you do have papers to write and you have all of that, but that really isn't, that's very much secondary to working with people because people are not bound by how they are bound in books. <laughs> um, so what do you all wish you knew before actually doing the work of being a social worker? A couple of you mentioned kind of being in and around and adjacent to the field, but being a social worker, what sorts of things um, do you wish you'd known before you started? I mean, I will say, I don't know what I thought an MSW program would be. <laughs> like, I knew like, oh, it's gonna be social justice, but, and I had picked clinical, but I don't think I ever realized like, oh, they are training us to become a mental health therapist. Um, and it wasn't until like a few classes in, in the first few weeks, I was like, oh, we are being trained to be a mental health therapist. And I don't know what I ever expected. I knew that I was going to learn how to essentially talk to people and like help people with their stuff. 
but I didn't know that specifically what I was doing. I don't regret it at all because it is so useful regardless if you become, like if you go down the clinical track, like let's say you decided to become a therapist and then get your LCSW and all these things, or you could be like me and use this stuff with college students, which is, um, I think I like my current work because it's a blend of the clinical work and also like academic support. Um, but I definitely did not expect to like, I don't know, be like in this kind of really rigorous program because I'm a therapist and I probably should have researched a little bit more before. I would say for me, so going into Hunter, um, I really had to grapple with the, the concept of like how and like how just the world is just really problematic, right? Um, there's just so many things that are wrong with with like the world, right? And when you are a social worker, you're kind of given the charge to do good, right? Like that's really like your the intention is to do good and to support and empower people to do well. And to, for me, I had to deal with like, whoa. And it's interesting, right? Because I knew that the world was like, we had like, the, we have a lot of healing and work to do, right? But when, as a, a particularly as a woman of color, like talking about communities in which that, that looked like mine and, and learning about redlining. And granted, like I already knew that in, ter in terms of just like being exposed to those concepts, but it's a very different lens when you bring it into social work with that charge of doing good, right? And like, you're going into the profession knowing that there's so many things, right? That we are constantly fighting around and through um, on a consistent basis. So I think for me, I wish I was more prepared right. to like be ready to like be in the mirror, right? And just see like, oh, wow, like that hurts. This is a lot like um, having difficult conversations around power and privilege when their communities at the center of it or the people that um, is, is a very interesting experience. So I think I was, I wish I was a little bit more prepared for that. And then I think just like in my career, um, compassion for fatigue is, is, is a thing, right? Like it is huge and it happens often in social work because if you're constantly hearing challenging, like difficulty, right? If you're constantly hearing difficulty, if you're constantly having to have the hat on like, how do I um, reduce harm? Or those those concepts can weigh very heavy, right, on one's heart, mind, and spirit, and it affects the work. And I think for me, as a social worker, and I'm doing it now, but it's 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 sometimes it's it's still hard, right? It's like how do you stay um, motivated and excited and encouraging when you know that they're talking about the same issues with the same communities or the same people all the time, right? It can get very frustrating to be at that sector of like frontlining, but also influencing and like pulling people together. And so like finding a way for yourself to get grounded back into your why is like a really important practice because when you're, like at my last job, I, I was there for six years and I'm like, if I have to talk to a young person one more time about this same particular thing, that's it's so macro, right? But it's also living and, and existing in this like this young baby's body, right? And like in his habits and his mind, et cetera. How do you negotiate those two things? Because it can be very sad, right? Your heart can break. And I feel like my heart has broken multiple times and you have to kind of like get back into your why, get back into like, no, like I'm called for this. This is what I want to do. I want to make a difference. Um, but that process is like a real process that you always have to be intentional about because then you'll find yourself and I have colleagues and friends that we talk about like someone told me something extremely hard and I felt nothing and then like they would cry right because it's like whoa I'm getting too disconnected what do I need to do for myself to get back plugged in because a true social worker is like is practicing presence and mindfulness so that you can be there for the people that you're serving um and so that's what I wish I would have. I'm still learning because it's a, it's a, it's truly is a process and a practice. I appreciate that, Kenya, because I was thinking along similar lines that my 
what I wish I had known is how hard it would be to see that kind of um, the suffering that we see every day. I mean, in, in different ways in our work. I mean, I worked at, um, I mentioned, you know, my seven years at NYU Medical Center, a grueling experience. I mean, seeing um, just the hardships that come with uh, the terrible healthcare system we have in this country and who's left behind and who's left to literally live or die, you know, depending on what resources they have access to and being faced with that every day and also charged with somehow fixing it, right? I mean, like that's what we signed up for. And yet when I got there, I was like, wait a second, I can't do anything about this specific thing right now. You know, I can be there for this person, but I can't change the circumstances that are surrounding, you know, this situation. And that was really really hard to figure out how do you um, stay kind of like Kenya was saying, like committed to the work, trying to further it. So advocating where you can um, and being there still with the suffering because it's there all the time um, in different ways. And it, and it was um, hard and sad and it still is. I mean, it's something that um, I moved to a state in here in Texas that has far fewer resources than New York did. And so I just, you know, some days definitely questioned like, why did I sign up for this profession where the goal is to connect to resources and help people, you know, help support them in lifting them up and there are no resources here. So what do I do with that? You know, and that was like a reckoning again, sort of a recentering and trying to figure out, okay, is this something I'm still committed to? And it is, I really love the work I do and try to bring in that advocacy piece whether whether it's in my little institution, you know, where I can to say like our charity care policy sucks. So, you know, so what if Texas doesn't have this safety net? We need to have something better. Just always trying to figure out those places where um, maybe you have to adjust that expectation, but you still can make some difference. And that is for sure something that comes with time. And so I think what I would tell you in this regard, what I wish I knew is something that I did happen to stumble upon at NYU and it was mentorship. So I was part of this program in my post masters. It, it was my last year of social work school into two years following and they really supported. It was a program for end of life care, palliative and end of life care, where they connected us with mentors, people in the field that were doing the work. And I cannot tell you, I know that I am still in this field because I had that really good mentorship early on because those hospital days were hard. And I was all the time questioning my decision about, you know, is this the place for me? And having those mentors that were able to say like, yes, it gets easier in time or you learn the ways to cope and to adapt and to keep yourself, you know, kind of strong enough to do this work. So that is something that I wanted to make sure to bring up that anywhere you can find it, if it's like in this screen, you you know, if it's with a Barnard alum or something, you know, so having someone that really knows you're part of the field is probably ideal, but really important to try to figure out how do you get that support for yourself? Because everyone's, you know, kind of tapped out. And so how do you find, you have to find it for yourself and raise your voice and figure out where to get that support. Yeah, thank you all for sharing that. Because it just, it seems like even though they're kind of different things, I think the through line is just knowing what you need and being able to ask for how you can get that and kind of be able to still be your best self at work while knowing that you have a self that you need to take care of. Um, and so last question before we open it up to questions from, from our audience. And you all are on camera for the most part and looking engaged, which is so rare and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what advice do you have for folks like the people in, on the screen who are interested in professional social work? What do you want to say to, the, to, to bring them in, to bring them into the fold? I would say in college, like volunteer and like try things out. I'm a big fan of trying things and seeing whether or not you like it. Um, and what I used to do, which is something my mentor told me, was like open like a document or an Excel sheet and start writing down the things you like about the things you're doing. So either an internship or volunteer work or a job, like what are the specific aspects you like, you know? And like that way you can slowly start gathering the things you like in terms of like, um, of like, because something like I want to help people is very broad and you can help people in so many different ways. So if you could start narrowing down like, okay, I really am good at helping kids apply to college. Okay, great. That's good. Uh, I really like working with college students. Okay, that's great. And so like 
kind of like slowly but surely and all this stuff. And if you figure out what you kind of like sooner rather than later, um, about a few years after I graduated, um, they created what's called a college advising core. And it's like this program you can do right out of college to become a college advisor. And so if it's something that you're super interested in, I would say jump on it because it's such a great learning opportunity to get into this field if you specifically want to be in college advising or maybe go on the higher ed side, but it's good to see both sides of it. So like, if this is specifically what you want to do, like we can definitely connect, but I also think like volunteering for places like Let's Get Ready and things like that um, is definitely the best way to start getting your feet wet. And I also will say, don't rush to get a degree. Um, it took me seven years to go back to school. Um, and I think I'm glad I took the time I did because now I'm absolutely sure, like, I'm really glad I got this degree. And also going back for a second master's would just be really expensive. So take your time in deciding what your next step is. I would also say it can be a long game, you know, building on what Vicky's saying about, um, you know, having a sense of what you want to do and also knowing that if it's not right, even if you're in the professional world and trying it out and it's not right, there are different ways that you can completely pivot and do something else like, you know, my fellow panelists keep saying, you know, there's a social worker everywhere. Um, you know, I think there's always another something you could try, which is really cool. But, um, you know, like I sort of alluded to my story, I knew really where I wanted to be in the field at the start. Um, and it's where I am now, but it's, you know, I'm class of 08, everyone, you know, it's like I got this job two years ago. So I was well into my 30s working, you know, in the professional world before I was in this job. And I couldn't have done it before, you know, it was something that I needed to have all of that experience before me um, to be able to be the lone social worker in a very busy um, cancer clinic. You know, I needed to learn all of that. So just to remember that it can be this winding road, you know, I think um, I would have it would have been helpful had someone told me that before I went down my path, not thinking I was going to run the agency, but thought I could work in my part of the field, you know, right out the gate. And that wasn't exactly true. But I don't regret any of that experience that I had to get in some of the more broad places that I worked in order to get here. So I'd keep that in mind. Um, I would say in terms of what you can be doing now, that's the question, right? Um, I would, depending on what you wanna do or like how you wanna um, support and strengthen like the folks that you're gonna work with is, um, I would say volunteer like now, right? So like, and volunteer in a way that's gonna allow you to stretch yourself, right? So if there is a population that when you think about um, that particular population, you're like, I really wanna make a difference, right? Um, but like do that, right? Like do the thing that's gonna require you to stretch um, because a big part of social work, it's all, it's like you're literally getting a master's in like how to um, work with people and like how to like navigate and negotiate, right? Like, and, and it's just, it's very interesting. Um, and so when you are, putting yourself out there, right? You're stretching yourself, right? You're like, you're, you're allowing yourself to say, oh, that was uncomfortable, why, right? Oh, I'm triggered, what's happening, right? Because like, if the more that you're putting yourself in those uncomfortable situations, the better social worker you will be, right? Because when you have that moment where someone is literally like trying to disenfranchise like a community right and like and you're at the table like you've worked and you've worked yourself well enough to be at the table like how you speak up how you share how you express which like all of that experience that you put in prior to is going to show up at that table when it really matters um and so a part of <clears throat> what i have found is that the more that i am stretching my voice right the more that i am being courageous enough to speak truth to power, like when I'm at certain tables where I can then influence um, policy or influence pro whatever the thing might be, there's a, there's, I just feel, I feel confident in that, right? And I also know that it's not coming from my trauma, it's not coming from fear or like all of the other things that can be very limiting. 
it's coming from the truth that I know and experience with working with the people, right? Because like I'm advocating and stepping in alignment with like the people that I'm supposed to be representing at like wherever it is that I go. So I would say like, just like really like seeking out those things that are going to stretch you. And like, particularly as it relates to you, right? Cause like, it's all about like the work that you're doing for yourself. Like if you're not, like, I feel like every social worker should have a therapist right? Why? The work is extremely hard, right? So like every social worker should have a therapist. Every social worker should have like a, a practice that allows them to get still so that they can get clear about what's coming up for them so that you're not transferring any of your stuff onto the particular client, right? Or community, et cetera. So like the more personal work that you do now, um, the better of a social worker you will be because your stuff won't get in the mix of the people that you're trying to work with. Thanks. That's all really great advice. So I want to clap it up for everyone. Um, thank you all so much for that. And now, room, what sorts of questions do you have? Oh, I see a hand raised. Um, Esther, if you want to just come off mute and yeah. go. Uh, thanks, Lindsay. Your questions were so excellent. And I wouldn't know how to put that into words. And you just asked exactly what I've been wondering. So thank you. And um, for the panelists, you guys are so eloquent and it's like really inspiring to hear you guys speak about your experience and your struggles and the moments that it clicked. Um, and so thank you for speaking to us. Um, so I have a few questions and I don't want to monopolize the time. So I might just ask all three and then you guys can kind of answer whatever you want. Um, so my first question is kind of practical because I think Angela, you mentioned, or I guess all three of you mentioned like, um, the difference in social work schools between clinical or community organizing slash advocacy. And I'm wondering to hear more about that and in terms of like what to look for, um, I guess when you're applying, like what are some keywords to notice uh, if you're seeking out one or the other? Um, are they mutually exclusive? Can you find what to vote? Um, my other questions, I guess, involve like um, the double, I'm hearing like a double edged sword um, in terms of social work, both uh, because you're on that front line, both with like secondhand trauma or trying to understand how to like interact with um, clients while while staying like centered in yourself, um, but also like in the bureaucratic systems and structures that you're taking, that you're like kind of powerless in the face of. So I'm wondering on both ends, what are some practical coping mechanisms? I know Kenny, you mentioned some like every social work so every social worker should see a therapist, stuff like that. Um, like what are some um, kind of practical ways that you can feel like you have control in, in both other people's emotional experience, holding other people's emotional experience and also like dealing with like a lot of paperwork, which kind of is daunting to me. Those are my questions. Thank you. Um, so many things come to mind. But I think the biggest thing for me to stay sane in any workplace, because like, let's be honest, right? Like every workplace um, is like, it's like neoliberal nonprofit structure, right? And that's like the words grad school has taught me. But like, it can be, and power dynamics are very a trick. Um, but I think the best thing is one, acknowledge it for what it is, right? So it's like, okay, this is the structure I'm in, this is the structure I'm working in. And then two, surround yourself with people who also understand it. Um, like there are definitely some bosses and some coworkers out here on the same page and understand all about power, privilege and oppression and understand how the very organizations we work for enact the same things towards our clients and all sorts of things. So there's definitely a lot of places that are willing and ready to grow. Um, and I always think it's so important when you interview for a place, you're interviewing them as well. No, they're not just interviewing you. Um, like for example, right now, I'm a consultant at Henry Street Settlement. And when I started interviewing, I was like, these are my pronouns, are you okay with it? Um, and that was a big deal to me. And so it's like, if a workplace isn't gonna accept that, then that's not a place I wanna be at. And that's okay. Like, it's okay to say that. Um, so I guess part of what I'm saying is also like, be picky. Um, they like, especially in the time that we're living now, it's, it's 
all these corporations put out all these messages a year ago being like Black Lives Matter. Okay, so now I'm going to hold you accountable to it. What work are you doing to diversify? What kind of work are you doing for equity? What kind of work are you doing for inclusion? Like, I'm going to actually hold you accountable. And so I think that can be part of like your questioning of them when you interview. Um, like, or even things like, how did you handle the pandemic? So you can see how they cared about their employees. Um, so I think, honestly, a support group. So like for me, I went to an undoing racism training with um, the People's Institute um, for, why am I forgetting? It's PSAP, like People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. And people that I networked in that training, honestly, is like a text chain. And when something messed up happens at work, I can text them and they'll be like totally validating, totally affirming, and it makes me feel better. And it doesn't make, it like reduces gaslighting and reduces making me feel like crazy. And so that can be like the most helpful. And like Kenya said, therapy, for sure. Um, I have my therapist, I have two therapists actually at the time. Um, and then like group therapy is great too finding peers who get it as well, um, joining Facebook groups that have um, therapists too. Like there's a, my favorite one is like a safe space for um, BI POC therapists. Like that can be really great too. Um, so like finding a way to like have support so you don't feel like you're going crazy in all of this. And mentorship too, I would add again, Vicki, that is different than your own therapy, finding someone who's down the line in the field several years who can sort of help you um, through those early years. And um, I just wanted to comment, Esther, because your question was so good about like choosing a program that clinical versus macro. The only advice I really have is that if you know you want one of those, don't go to a place that doesn't say they do that. So, I mean, there would be some people I know that would be in my classes, like, I really want to learn about, you know, organizing. And they, you know, just were really disappointed because they didn't have a strong set of classes to offer. So don't like put that out of your mind and say like, oh, it'll be fine. It won't be what you need or want if that's really what you're committed to, is what I would say. Um, yeah, and I think just to piggyback off of what Angela said, like if when you read, um, so I think, so I know NYU is very clinical, right? It's just a, a very clinically based school versus, and I think also Columbia is too, even though like they have like the um, social policy track, et cetera. But I think if you looked at like a Hunter and like a NYU and just read, um, like read the descriptions, you'll see like how um, institutions like either pull pra like practice or theory and like how they like have that conversation, right? Like you'll be able to tell just like um, the focus of like the school. Um, and then I think in terms of like this double-edged sword, um, one thing that's important to like, you'll have moments where you feel um, like, like you are, like you don't have power, but like you really do, right? Um, and the question is, is like, do you have power of authority, power of influence, right? Um, and like, how does that show up in your work? Um, because there will be moments where you're like, I don't know how to fix this. And then you either have to tap into your power of authority hat, like, or like, how do I then influence the things that are around me in order to get this particular person, client, organization, whatever the thing, whatever the client is, right? Um, the thing that they need. Um, and then in terms of like, what do you do in order to like stay grounded? Just tap into your why, like why? Because the reason why people usually are interested in social work is that they've either had um, a, a transformational moment right, where they then now want to do good, right, like, or they have a story to tell that really makes um, the helping profession so important to them, um, and so really get clear about why social work, like, why is it that you want to spend your career dismantling, supporting, encouraging, like, the human race, right, like, why that is, and just get very clear about that, because there have been, I mean, this, the last, like, leading in a pandemic I'm, I've had to tap into my why maybe like every single day because I would have been gone by now because it's really really hard to fly um and so I think like getting clear about your why right like I am a transformer of communities like whatever the thing is it's like important um everything that they said around therapy and then for me 
I had to like, particularly when I was in Hunter, because again, like it was really hard to examine the communities in which I come from, right? And the people in which I, it was very, very hard for me to do that. And so keeping a journal, like for me has been the most transformative, like it's, I do my own therapy with my journal. It's very interesting. Like, it's like, I can go back a year or two years for my journal and like reread underlying questions like, oh, that's a problematic thought or I'm seeing patterns of this. So it's very interesting, but I, I will say that like keeping a track of your experiences and like how you show up in those experiences and what shows up in those experiences will allow you to be um, a better social worker because then when you go back to the text, you can kind of sit with your old selves. And then also like it allows you a space in real time to process and unpack. Um, so everything that everyone else said, the why, and then also the journals and things that I would add. Thanks. So we've hit 202. And so I want to be mindful of our panelists' time because I know they're working. Um, this people often fit these in on our on their lunch break. So I appreciate that. Um, I don't know if, if you guys need to leave or if you have time for one more question. It's totally fine either way. I really appreciate kind of this engagement. I could do one more. I just messaged um, someone. I have a supervision, so I'm okay. Yeah, give me a sec. I did want to say one thing in terms of taking clinical versus like community organizing. If you want to get like on a practical level, if you want to get an LMSW, if you do community organizing, you will have to take extra courses in order to get the LMSW, which is like clinical based. And so a lot of my friends who did go down the community organizing track are now finding themselves like, oh, I have to take an extra clinical class or I have to take an extra thing so I can take the MSW exam. Um, and so on a practicality, if you want the licensure, then clinical probably is your best bet. But the good thing is at Hunter now, because I pushed for this, because I was that clinical person who wanted to take community organizing class and now they're offering community organizing classes as an elective. So you get to have a little bit of both even if you're on the clinical track. Are there any questions? One thing too, I'd put in the chat, um, we have a mentorship platform called Barnard Connect, which you all can join. Even our alum panelists can hop on there and find folks either you want to connect with alum to alum or allow students to connect with you too. So it's a, it's a great platform um, that's a little bit new, but has come in handy now that we're all in front of our computers. So any final questions? Anyone want to close it out? Okay, I see the hand raised, Talia Rosen. Oh my God, taking the last question. Um, but I was just wondering for those of you who work more specifically in mental health, do you ever feel like it's a disadvantage that you don't have like a PsyD or a PhD, like you get less respect in the field or anything like that or? Not in my, my not in my workplace, Talia, because there are no PsyDs or PhDs to be found. So, you know, it's interesting that I, it's a great question because, and I wondered a lot about it. Um, I haven't worked, I've worked three places and none of them all in a mental health type role and none of them had PsyDs or PhDs anywhere. It was clinical social workers did, that did, did and led most of the care. Now I do work in conjunction very closely with a psychiatrist. So that, um, but I find that our work as I've become more confident in my skills and what makes them unique for some of the reasons that like Kenya and Vicky and I have been talking about, I realize how much we actually don't overlap. So the questions about, um, you know, he prescribes medication and can do great medication evaluations and consultations that I don't even begin to say that I can touch. Some clinical social workers um, can do a little bit more talking about um, psychopharmacology. It's not something that I've had a lot of training in. Um, but for me, in my experience, that question hasn't come um, up at all. Um, I will say that, um, the one thing that I would say is your question about respect. Um, I've worked in healthcare settings, in a hospital setting, where certainly the social workers were uh, the bottom of the barrel in terms of respect from the collective group. It was something that made it very hard at the beginning. And that's why I needed my mentor to talk to me about ways that I could 
find my voice and find my strength and my skill set and find the ways that, in fact, I could um, influence a bit more than I thought. So I think that it, I will not, um, I did, I didn't want to just let that slide by because it's a real, a real practical challenge that I still have all the time as I work alongside doctors that don't know what a social worker does or claim that they don't. And as far as I'm concerned, there's no reason why that should be a legitimate thing to say in a healthcare setting in 2021. But that's part of my work to, um, to try to educate and say like, these are the things that we can do. This is why you want a social worker on your team. This is why we're better than the PsyD that you thought about, you know, hiring because we can talk to your patients about resources and all these other things too, and take care of their mental health. So that, that was a question that puts me on my soapbox because it's like it touches some buttons. But um, I, in my experience, that first part of your question, not something that I've had to deal with at all. Yeah, I wanted to say like, I feel like in the, so I did work in mental health for a little bit. I feel like in the time I did work in it, the clients kind of liked me more than their psych D because they would be the person they go to for medication, right? And like, it would be like maybe a 15 minute meeting, maybe. And they got me for 45 minutes. And so like, and then, and usually the psych D would be more like, okay, what are you feeling? What's your weight? What's your height? All this stuff so they can figure out what to prescribe as opposed to like this real personal touch where we have conversations about the systems and power and privilege and oppression and all this stuff. And so like, for me, because I am a client centered social worker, like for me, it's always about the client. And so like, I can tell that my clients don't really like the psych D's they tend to interact for. And like, I understand there's this whole hierarchical system in this mental health world, but my, part of my job is to find where I can break that down. And I think part of that is in just the relationship with my client. So like, when it comes to therapy, I let them lead because I'm not trying to be an authority figure for them. Like that is not my goal. And so I kind of try to lead by example when it comes to interacting with peers and stuff. And I'm like, there's no hierarchy here for me. And some of them might get really frustrated with me for it, but I think it's probably the best approach because there shouldn't be a hierarchy. There shouldn't be power dynamics in mental health the way they are. Yeah, I don't think that this is i uh, I'm like very much so like admin supervisory. So yeah, not my lane. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, on that note, thank you all so much um, for coming and for sharing your experiences, sharing your questions. We've got an email, Vicki's email in the chat. And if other panelists, if you want me to share your emails with students, feel free to, okay. So in a follow-up email, you'll get their email addresses and hopefully keep these conversations going. And thank you all again. I really appreciate it. I appreciate all of your time, all of your engagement. Thank you. It's always a treat thank to you. be with our women. It's just, you need it, you know. Thank you, everyone. Thank you guys so much. This was so well. Yeah.